What's going on everybody? My name is Johnny Bannon and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trepid Technologies. And in today's video, we're going to be going over domain 2.2 of our Security Plus SY0-701 video series. So this is going to go over threat vectors. Where in our previous subdomain 2.1, we went over threat actors. Now we're going to get into the vectors of attack. So how do we get inside the network, right? What transmission mediums are we going to use? So with that being said, let me go ahead and get my face out of the way. And let's go ahead and get started on the lecture. So again, we're going to be going over domain 2.2, common threat act, threat vectors, and attack surfaces. So the objectives, so we're going to break this up into three different uh, slides or three different videos. So the first thing we're going to talk about is these objectives here. So message-based, image-based, file-based, voice call-based removal device vectors. Then we're going to go into vulnerable software. And what we're talking about here is just how software can be malicious, right? It's a way to uh, download malicious payloads. And then we're going to go over this section right here in the next video. And then we're going to cap this subdomain off by going over this human vectors slash social engineering. All right. So what is a threat vector? So a threat vector in cybersecurity refers to the means or pathway through which a cyber attack is carried out. It is the method or route used by an attacker to access, exploit, and potentially damage or steal data, disrupt operations, or insert malicious software into a system or network. A, a long way to say that a threat vector is just how they get in. So if I'm driving a car, how do I get to my destination? What do I use? The highway. This is very similar, right? Where the vector is maybe that car on that highway and the attacker is you driving, right? So the exploitation of vulnerabilities, that's a threat vector. So attackers often use threat vectors to exploit known vulnerabilities in software, hardware, or human behavior. And there's so many different types of common threat vectors that we're going to go over, like social engineering, and then all different ways we can conduct social engineering. Okay, so now we're going to go over message-based threats and email. So email is a common vector for phishing attacks, malware distribution, and social engineering. And that line kind of like ties it all together, right? A phishing attack, its purpose is to get you to download malware or to steal information, and that's a social engineering attack, right? So what are the risks with email-based vectors, malware, phishing attacks, spear phishing attacks, and business email compromise? Well, essentially what we're saying is that if you're being social engineered and you get an email that has a malicious link sent to your business email, your corporate email, well, that could have caused a cyber incident for the entire organization. Where if this is going to your personal email, that may just download a virus or malware on your personal computer that may not affect the enterprise. Now, I say may because as we know in our modern day enterprise, the network boundaries are not just on-prem anymore. You could be working from home and now you have to be wary of your personal email because if you download viruses on your personal email, they could potentially spread to your enterprise because you probably have some sort of VPN or connection off to your cloud-based services or something connecting you back to the enterprise. So something we have to think about. Message-based threats. So now, same thing without SMS. So this is where we just send uh, attacks via SMS. That's the threat vector. <laughs> And a lot of times these messages contain links leading to phishing sites or malware downloads. Very common one, as you see I've kind of drawn up here or put together, is you'll get a text message saying, hey, we need to verify your account. And so it looks real to you like, oh, yeah, that looks like my bank. That looks like this service that I use a lot. Let me log in. Let me re-verify my password because maybe that company is just looking out for me. And now you just got credential harvested, right? So a lot of times SMS does lead to something called credential harvesting where they're essentially just redirecting you to a malicious site. Instant messaging, same thing, okay? Now instead of SMS, it's just IM. So this could be considered WhatsApp. This could be Instagram DMs, TikTok DMs, Facebook DMs. So, I'll, so we run a small business or I run my small business trip at Technologies. So we have a, a business Facebook. I probably get, this is from my messenger. I get messages like this probably once a day where they say, hey, you violated this policy. You need to verify your page or we're going to take away your business page. And you see this user, they're not very clever in trying to hide things. 
Now, when this first happened to me, when I first started my Facebook business page, starting out, you're so nervous as a business owner. When I got this message, they had a better username. It was like Facebook support and then it had the logo. I got freaked out for a second. I was like, did I violate something? And then I realized it's so silly. Why would Facebook reach out to me and my IM saying I violated a page and have a sketchy link like this, right? And as you can see, someone that isn't technically inclined and doesn't teach cybersecurity, this would probably work, especially if you're a small business worried about your social media presence. You could probably click this and be like, oh yeah, let me make sure I'm not messing anything up. So a lot of times there's this belief that small businesses are not attacked, but they are. Everyone's attacked. And if you put yourself out there on social media, more than likely you're going to get an I am social engineering attack or this message-based threat. Image-based threats. So attackers use images to exploit vulnerabilities in image processing software or embed malicious code. This is usually referred to as something called steganography, where they, that's the term for it, hiding executable code within an image file. So essentially we can get sent images and there could be something malicious embedded in that image. Kind of like uh, when, that, when you download an Excel spreadsheet, they'll have macro viruses. Very similar, right? Where it's embedded in that image download and you may just think, hey, it's a .png, this should be safe. When in reality, maybe when you actually open up that file, that malicious code in the back end gets ran. Or there may be something hidden. That's what the point of steganography, right? Hiding something in plain sight, hiding in with, within an image. File-based threats. So malicious files can be disguised as legitimate documents or media files. The most basic one, right, is this will look like a PDF, and they'll make the file name uh, yourfile.pdf. And then what you don't see as a regular user is that it's actually a .exe. You open up that PDF and now you may have just ran a virus, right? So the risks with this, Trojans, ransomware, worms, they all exploit software vulnerabilities and they're all file-based. Which essentially means that on your system, when you get one of these file-based viruses or malware, they're going to get installed. So they're going to take up storage. They're going to be a file on your actual system. Voice call threats. So this is just using the phone, right? Another vector of attack on a victim is just using the phone to call. And typically this is going to be in, used in conjunction with a lot of good social engineering techniques and tactics like impersonation or authority. When you can see my example here, the attacker is saying, Yes, we need your account information so I can reset your account or else payroll cannot be ran and I'll have to report this to the CFO. So essentially this attacker found somebody that probably works in accounting where his or her job relies on them running payroll or that's what they've learned through their reconnaissance and now they're using a position of authority and intimidation to say, hey, I need your account. I'm from the IT help desk, so also a little impersonation to actually run payroll or you won't be able to, right? And maybe if you're new, you're really worried about your job at the time, these social engineering principles can be used against you to actually fall victim to a voice call attack. All right, removable media. So removable devices like USBs, there used, there was, I can't remember the actual article, but there was a major attack where attackers were leaving USBs in parking lots and then employees would go pick up those USBs, plug them into the computer to see what was on them, and boom. Now you just infected your whole enterprise and now there's going to be a cybersecurity incident. So risk, obviously, removable devices is the malware will spread. Data theft. So it could just be you plug in that USB and someone has a script on there that does data exfiltration and it may not affect your computer. So you may not even notice anything. And then we have vulnerable software. So we're going to have something called client-based and agentless-based vulnerable software. So software installed on client devices can contain vulnerabilities when exploited, lead to unauthorized access or data compromise. A major one, like at the large scale, is something like SolarWinds. So SolarWinds was a simple network management protocol software that was used throughout the government. And you can kind of, it was a server, but it's client-based software, right? We would install it on our Windows Server 2016 machines as our SNMP managers and server. And it had a backdoor. So sometimes you can install software you may think is not malicious, and now there's a back door on it, okay? So some of the risks with software you may be installing, especially if it's third party, is malware infection, data breach, or unauthorized access. 
And then we have agentless. So what this is kind of a little confusing, especially when I saw it on the exam objective. So let me break this down. What they're saying is that with agentless software, that means when you're doing, let's say, any malware, any virus or vulnerability scanning, there's different ways you can deploy it. So you can deploy actual like, let's just say a, a any malware or AV suite on the computer and that reports back to a centralized server. That's not agentless. That's agent based where there's actual software installed on that individual system. With agentless, you have a centralized server or a system that makes like a network connection to the computer to gather information without actually installing an application on there or actual software. So that's agentless. So what's the risk here with agentless software? Well, if that server that's running that agentless software that's maybe doing vulnerability scans or scanning for malware without actually installing anything on your computer, that means they're having probably a elevated connection, an elevated privilege connection to that computer and pulling data back and forth. So what's there's a lot of vulnerabilities there. One, that could be sensitive data coming from computer to this server that someone could be doing a packet capture on. Or this could have malware installed in it. And during those network connections, maybe it's going and finding personal PII data and then exfiltrating it off to a malicious actor outside of the network. So a lot of different ways, right? And essentially what we're saying here for agentless-based scanning or software is ensure that the actual server that hosts that agentless-based software is secure. That's the best way to mitigate vulnerabilities in agentless based software. All right, guys, so that's going to be it. As you can see here, this is going to be the start of our next section. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to bring up our Academy uh, LMS site and we're going to do some practice exam questions. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. So now we're going to go over our practice exam uh, software and our quiz. So when you purchase one of our courses, Self-Paced Live Virtual Training, you get over a thousand practice questions for your Security Plus exam, and this is the software that we use. This is available on your desktop, mobile, and we have an application coming by the end of April, start of May 2024, which will also have these practice exams. All right, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna read off the question, and then I want you to pause the video, answer it yourself, and then I'm gonna go and play the video again, and I'm gonna answer it for us. So question one, why is SMS considered a vulnerable communication method in terms of security? So I'm going to go with C, susceptibility to interception and smishing attacks. All right. And as you can see here, uh, every single one of our questions on our practice exam software gives you an explanation as well. So it's pretty cool. No matter if you get it wrong or right, you always get the correct answer and explanation down below. Question two. Why is software vulnerability a critical attack surface? So I'm going to go with B. They can be exploited to gain unauthorized access or damage systems. So that is correct. Question three. What makes instant messaging platforms a target for cyber threats? So I am. So I'm going to go with B, actually. Um, I, I really don't know because we make these questions and then I, weeks later, right? I'm going to go with the popularity and the large user base. And that's because it's really easy to just send out bulk uh, messages, social engineering messages on social media, especially when people have public profiles. So, yep, that is correct. It's the large user base what makes it so popular. Question four. How does the use of removable devices pose a security risk? So obviously we're going to go with C, the potential for introducing malware and data leakage. So when you bring in those external devices and plug them into a system on your enterprise and you don't know what's on there, obviously it's a bad day, right? You don't want to be plugging in random things into your enterprise uh, computers or laptops. And then for this last question, guys, I'm going to answer it wrong just to show you how our explanation works when you get an answer wrong and to show you kind of this bar up here for your progress. So question five. How do attackers com commonly exploit email as a threat vector? So I'm going to go with obviously D is wrong and it's going to give us the correct answer down here. So it's actually B by using it to distribute phishing links and malware. And then we have the explanation down here. 
So email is a prevalent attack vector used by cyber criminals, primarily for phishing and distributing malware. And then we can see our results. We can see what we got wrong and what we got right. Awesome. So now I'm just going to go back to my face full screen and we're going to end this video. All right, guys, so that's going to be it for this video. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're an active duty, reserve, or National Guard soldier, click that link in the description below and see how you get and see how you can apply for four grand of credentialing assistance and certification assistance. That's right. If you're in the Army, you get four grand a year, doesn't matter if you're reserve, National Guard, or active duty, to get free training for all your certification needs. And we're, we're a vendor. So if you're interested in seeing how that works and how to apply, click that link below and thank you for viewing.